On Jordan's stormy banks I stand and cast a wistful eye to Canaan's fair and happy land where my possessions lie. We will rest in the fair and happy land by and by just across on the evergreen shore. Sing the song of Moses and the Lamb by and by, and dwell with Jesus evermore. Filled with delight, my raptured soul would hear no longer stay.
I'd like to go ahead and mark your hymn book, so I'm encouraged to be number 939. Oh, why not? Stand? 939. And if you'd like to stand, we'll sing the first and last number 895. I'll live in glory, first and last. Then our message will be delivered. All right. I'd like to stay here longer than man's allotted days And watch the fleeting changes of life's uneven ways But if my Savior calls me to that sweet home on high I'll live with Him forever in glory by and by Oh yes, I'll live in glory by and by visiting with us. We appreciate you being here with us and we are going to continue in a series that we've been doing talking about the elements of Christianity. Uh, the four things that make up this world, you know, fire, water, air, uh, and earth. Uh, we've talked about three of those so far. We've talked about water as we talked about last week and sanctification. And then two weeks ago we talked about uh, groundedness. We talked about the ground and humility. And this week we want to talk about air. We want to talk about life. And life, as we just read a second ago, a life that Jesus is wanting to give us more abundantly. With, with a conversation like this, uh, I think it begins in Genesis chapter 2 when we think about air, when we think about the very life power of how we know people are alive. We know people are alive because they have the ability to breathe, right? We know that people are alive because when you put your hand in front of their face, you feel this puff of what we will call air. But what they call in the Bible wind or spirit, uh, the words can be used interchangeably that you see this being produced out of someone's mouth and somebody's life. Uh, this is in chapter 2 of Genesis. Chapter 2 of Genesis. This is specifically in verse 7, a passage that we've read a couple of times uh, since I've been here. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground. And breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. Now a couple of things. It's interesting that God forms man, that he forms him like a potter. This is how Jeremiah will even think of himself a little bit later in Jeremiah chapter 1. But here he forms him like a potter forms clay. And then to give the, potter, the, the pottery life, 
he just takes him, and I almost think always that he takes him and he breathes into his nostrils. He, he literally is face to face and breathes into the man the very life of God, the very, very thing of who God is. That is what makes us who we are. God is a God of life. You can even see this being used later in a passage that I know that we read during our Ezekiel study, but Ezekiel chapter 37, if you'll turn there with me. In Ezekiel chapter 37, in Ezekiel chapter 37, uh, Ezekiel is taken by the hand of the Lord and brought to this valley, and he notices all around him that there is nothing but dry bones. It's just bones upon bones upon bones. The image that you're supposed to have is that of a battlefield, of a great battle that took place. And here, these are the remains of that great battle. And here he says, uh, God asks Ezekiel, can these bones live in verse 3? And Ezekiel, knowing the power of God, he says, well, you know, you know, like he almost turns the question back on God. And this is what he says. Verse 4, again, he said to me, prophesy to these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, surely I will cause breath to enter into you and you shall live. I will put sinews on you and bring flesh upon you, cover you with skin and put breath into you and you shall live. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I prophesied, there was a noise and suddenly a rattling, and the bones came together bone to bone. Indeed, as I looked, the sinews and the flesh came upon them, and the skin covered them over, but there was no breath in them. It's important for Ezekiel to acknowledge that just because the bones were all in the right spot, because the flesh covered up everything, these people... Were not truly people just yet. They weren't just. A, 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 they weren't actually living. They weren't actually filled with anything, with any life. It's not until the Lord breathes into them that this, that Ezekiel prophesies for the Spirit of the Lord God to come down upon them that they actually gain life. This is in verse nine. Also, he said, "Prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, Thus says the Lord God." Come from the four winds of breath and breathe on these slain that they may live. And obviously this becomes an allegory for, or a, a, an object lesson for Ezekiel because this is what the Israelites have been saying. They say in verse 11, our bones are dry, our hope is lost, and we ourselves are cut off. This is how the Israelites see themselves as lifeless as without hope, as without anything of importance that moves them on into the next phase of their life. They see themselves as dead and gone away. And the only one that can give them life is the Lord. Now I want you to notice something about that last part that I said. One thing about life is that life is more than just survivability. We'll say it in that way. We probably haven't tried to survive very recently. <laughs> um, uh, we go to the grocery store, and there are food on the shelves. Now the, now, the news will make you think that there is this great food shortage, but every time I go to the grocery store, whether it be the Big Star up here, whether it be Publix or Walmart, there is food. Sometimes it might not be the food that I like, but it's food nonetheless. Um, I gas is pretty expensive, and I have not gone without gas. Right. Uh, there is food abundant. There is all of these things, and I say all of this to say I haven't had to quote unquote survive. I haven't had to survive. Uh, here, the Israelites actually have a problem where they do have to find a way to survive. Which makes us think a little bit more about what does it mean to live? What does it mean to live? What does it mean to have life? Because we could just boil everything down to breathing in and out and just realizing that this, this is just what life is. Life is breathing in and out. Breathing in and out. And that is it. But you know, life, life is more than that. 
Life is filled with ups and downs. Life is filled with these different things of, of greatness, of joy. And even we are built up by heartache and loss and trouble. That life is more than just survivability. A good example of this is actually in the movie Soylent Green. Has anybody seen this movie, Soylent Green? Charlton Heston um, is a cop. In actually, I, I didn't know this until today when I looked up when the movie was set. It was set in 2022. <laughs> so, uh, uh, Soylent Green's a movie from the 19, about 1973. And Charlton Heston plays a cop in 2022 in an ecological dystopia. Right? Uh, the world is overrun by people. The world, the world is just littered with, with people living on top of each other. There's no, there's no real food. There's no real place for anybody to thrive. There's no grass and no green. It's just buildings on top of buildings on top of buildings. One of the problems with, uh, with Soylent Green or one of the things that happens in the movie is that they sit there and they're, they finally, one day, him and his friend Saul finally get some sort of food. And Saul lived before the world got so bad. He actually knew exactly what to do. Charlton Heston hadn't actually uh, lived in a world that hadn't been covered up by people. And so one of the scenes in the movie is that they have a meal together. I think they had found some, some beef or they had found a can of chili or something along those lines. It wasn't Soylent Green for the first time in their life. And they finally began to start eating. And what's interesting about the scene, if, you'll, if you watch it, is... Charlton Heston is kind of like, he's just, he doesn't really know what to do. He's not really sure about this. And Saul actually tells him, calm down, like relax, you know, notice the small blessings. Right? Notice that, uh, that here you have this apple and you just eat the apple and you just take one bite and Charlton Heston eats the entire thing and leaves nothing but the twigs. Or they have this can of chili, and he's never had chili before, and so he takes a spoonful, and he really, really likes it. I think the goal of the scene in that moment when they're eating all the food is that actually to stop for a second and taste like what you have. It's, it's actually realizing that you don't have to hurry up and eat it all. Right? You don't actually have to spend all your time just shoving it down your gullet. It's actually to stop... And to realize that there's something more to life than just surviving. And Jesus thinks this as well. Like Jesus spends time uh, thinking about this. If you'll notice, a passage is like this. This is in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 27. He talks about anxiety and talks about worry. And he says this specifically in Matthew chapter 6 verse 27. And which of you being anxious... Can add a single hour to his span of life. Uh, or some translations might even say, how can he even add another inch to his height? Right? What does worrying do? Does it make you bigger or taller? No, it doesn't. Uh, does it add another hour? No. In fact, now with science, we've proven that anxiety has built up problems in your heart and has caused you actually to lose hours of your life. In Luke chapter 12 and verse 23, Jesus will say, For life is more than food, and the body more than clothing. Uh, Mark 8 verse 35, For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. That Jesus puts these comparisons that the one that's constantly trying to survive, the one that's constantly trying to continue his life and push his life even further, misses the whole point. But the one who sacrifices himself for the very name of Jesus, the one who gives his life for the very mission of what Jesus is trying to do, that he understands life and he will save it and he will have even more life in the future. The passage that Ricky just read for us a minute ago in John chapter 10, this is in verse 10. Uh, Jesus this, this is the good shepherd and he shows himself to be the good shepherd. Um, verse 7 of John chapter 10. Then Jesus said to them again, most assuredly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. 
The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. He separates himself from the thieves and from the robbers. And then he sets himself up as the door, the one where the sheep can come in and go, where they can find food and where they can find rest, where they can recognize that they don't have to worry, but that life is abundant. Life is more than just what's in front of them. I think about Paul, who Paul finds joy despite being in prison. Philippians chapter 1, if you'll go there with me. Like life, and for Paul, I would imagine if you're in prison and there's no cafeteria and there's no place for you to actually sit and to find some sort of rest that you're constantly thinking, how am I going to get the next meal? How am I going to be okay? Paul finds joy in these moments of imprisonment that he can even think of the positives rather than the negatives. That's not the life of someone trying just to survive. That's someone seeing the blessing that God has provided for them despite their present situation. Notice that Paul finds joy in the people. Uh, verse 3 of Philippians chapter 1. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, making requests for you with all with joy. Um, if you'll notice a little bit further down in verses 12 through 18, you'll notice that he is excited that even though he sits in prison, he's still able to talk to the guards. Even though he's in prison there and even though the people speak ill against him, Paul is still excited that, that Christ is preached and that Christ goes out and spreads all throughout the world, even from the guards to the rest of the world. That despite Paul's circumstance... He finds pleasure and he finds a, 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 a joy in that things continue even though he's in prison, even though everything looks bad. This is not the lifestyle of someone who just wants to survive. This is somebody that even wants to, to live this life, someone who wants to thrive in this life. Because when bad things happen, we kind of shut down and we just hope to make it to the next step. That sometimes we're shutting down and we feel like our faith moves across when we've got a busy, busy schedule. When we've got heartaches and losses that have happened all around us. When people are falling left and right and that we're wondering, man, is anything ever going to get better? We might even pause our faithful life. We might even say, I, I can't come to church right now. You know, I can't pray. I can't do this and that because my life is just crazy. And like this morning, Jesus calms those storms, and yet we forget that. Yet we forget what Christ wants to do for us. Notice in James, uh, we've read this passage, uh, and probably we've read this passage hundreds of thousands of times. But in James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4, this is what uh, James says, the brother of Jesus. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But, or steadfastness, as the ESV might say. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. This is the ultimate goal, is that despite trials, you find it joyous. You find it great. You rejoice at the fact of suffering. Why? Because in it, you become stronger, more patient, more steadfast. You become firmer in what you believe. You become even more of the person and that life can still flourish. You're not just surviving that point. You're continuing on in the mission. You're continuing on in what you're supposed to do. Despite whatever suffering comes into your life. Despite whatever heartache begins to build up. When our relationships break down, Christ continues to prevail. Christ continues to have his hand in our life. I think the application for a lesson like this is that life is not just about the step right after the next step. Sometimes we get into that rhythm where our, our, we're just trying to get to the next thing, trying to get to the next thing, trying to get to the next thing. And if I get to the next thing, then I'll be OK. Now, in some ways, that's helpful. In some ways, that's helpful. It's, it, it's helpful that if we're dealing with some sort of problem in our life to, to push through and to say, now, here's to the next thing. 
And I think a lot of times what causes us to, to miss out on life is to miss out on what Christ is doing for us at the present moment. Like right now, you might be going through some heartache and some trouble, some, some problem, and you might forget that right now Christ continues to bless you even though you are blind to it. Even though you're missing it, Christ continues to bless you just as he blessed you two weeks ago when the problems weren't there. Or three weeks ago when the problems weren't there. That life is all about recognizing joy. Now this is important when we think about evangelism. We've... Uh, uh, Many preachers before me have even said this. How do we know that you're Christians? Are, are we the joyful people? Are we the people that show love? Are we the people that care for others? Are we the people that rejoice in the Lord always? And again, I say rejoice. And that's how we define ourselves and how we separate ourselves from the world. Is that we are a joyful people. And when we live for more than just surviving... For more than just the next day, for more than just the next week, or more than, for the, uh, more than just the next event, that we begin to start seeing God's work here, right here and right now. And we never want to be blind to what the Lord is doing. So I think that we ought to exist for more than just survival. I think we ought to try to do more for ourselves. And that means in our life, pausing and being more thankful for the things that we have, for the fact that we were able to get groceries, for the fact that we were able to buy gas, that we were able to get what we needed today. Even if it was harder, thank the Lord that we were still able to do it, that we might want to look and to thank God, thank God not for, uh, for the things that we still have. If there's a pain in our right arm, thank the Lord that our left arm still works. If we're still struggling with this broken relationship, thank the Lord for the relationships that I do have. And Lord, bless me and help me to, to mend that relationship that I'm having so much trouble with. When I'm doing more than just trying to survive, I think I see ourselves being more generous and more kind. And uh, bringing more peace to the people around us. When I'm not just thinking about myself, when I'm not inward, when I'm not looking to myself just about what helps me or makes me better or makes me uh, even more. That I look to others and I think, man, how can I better their life? This is what brings Paul joy in uh, Philippians chapter 1 and verse 27. This is the manner of life that you should have in which you live in the same mind. That you're constantly desiring to do more for others. Not only just that, but I think that we ought to be faithful. That we ought to, that we can show this faithfulness to others. And show what it means to be a Christian. What it means to be someone who has that abundant life. That Jesus so richly wants to give us. But sometimes we're still, as we talked about this morning in our lesson. We're still apathetic. We might be apathetic towards others. We might be so self-focused on our own selves that, that we think about ourselves and we're always worried about ourselves. We're worried about how we're going to feel that we never think about that the harvest is plentiful. And where are all of our labors? Are we being apathetic and are we being negative to the things that are happening all around us? And I don't want us to do that. I'd like to close reading one scripture, and this is in 1 John, 1 John chapter 1, 1 John chapter 1, this is actually the, just the first uh, four verses, the first five verses of this, of, of 1 John chapter 1. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled, concerning the word of life. The life was manifested, and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life, which, is, which was with the Father and was manifested to us, that which we have seen and heard, we declare to you, 
that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And these things we write to you that your joy may be full. This is the message which we have heard from him and declare to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. This life, a life that's more than just survival, a life that's more than just worrying about the future or worrying and building up anxiety about what we will eat or what we will drink or what we will wear, that these things are actually leading us towards not a life at all. Church, the challenge for us this week, the challenge for us tomorrow, is actually to have some sort of a Sabbath. <laughs> um, or to, to actually rest and to see that the Lord is good. It's to stop and to realize, man, how great is it to be a Christian? How great is it to, to be a servant of the living God? That he's blessed me with all of these things. For parents, he's blessed us with children. For husbands, he's blessed us with wives. For, for wives, he's blessed us with husbands. For children, he's blessed us with parents. And man, if I get a chance to, to talk to somebody today, let it be so. If it be that I run into somebody who needs to hear the gospel, let it be so. If it be somebody that needs to see what true life in Christ is, let it be so. This morning, you might not have that life. Or this evening, you might not have that life. You may not know of where your eternity lies. Uh, we talked a little bit about that this morning. Maybe this evening you need to be baptized for the remission of your sins, to receive the forgiveness of sins that you might live a new life in Christ. Maybe tonight you need prayers for forgiveness. Maybe it's public and it needs to be said out loud, a confession before the whole congregation. Or maybe tonight it's that you need to say it in private to me or one of the elders. Whatever it is, we're here for you. Let's live this week. And let's stand and sing. Oh, do not let the word depart. And close thine eyes against the light. For Oh uh -huh.